Hello, I'm Bob the Bookerer and welcome to my channel. Um, and today I just wanted to talk about the books that I've been reading this week. Um, and uh, it's been a fun sort of fun bit of reading. I've been doing these bits of reading alongside the Booker. So to kind of keep it as, I mean, otherwise this could basically very easily be half current Booker long list, um, which I've now finished <laughs> at the time of filming. Finally. Uh, so I I've, I've finished reading them, um, but just to avoid that kind of completely dominating, here are some other books um, that I've read this week. Uh, so let's get started talking about them, and I hope you're having a great week. First up, um, and I mean, I know I'm saying not the booker, but it's a different prize. Um, but I read uh, Neon Roses by Rachel Dawson, um, which is shortlist, uh, longlisted rather for the Polari Prize. Um, and this is just a, a really sort of joyous book. Um, if you've seen the film Pride or kind of know of that sort of time frame around uh, LGSM, so les lesbian and gays support the minors, um, which were a sort of uh, uh, a group that basically sought solidarity at a time of a lot of struggle in the UK. So this was a time where lots of uh, miners were on strike because mines were being closed. Um, and also a time where lots of LGBTQIA plus people were advocating for rights. And so a lot of um, the LGSM basically was founded as a way of showing solidarity from a kind of queer campaigning groups to minors who are struggling often to feed um, families um, because of sort of, you know, they were off work or whatever else. Um, and this book in many ways focuses in on that, and particularly uh, in a sort of a very, there's a very sort of time capsule quality to this book. Um, it's set very much in a period of the 80s that features a lot of Kate Bush, which made me very happy. Um, and it's in sort of, you know, in parts of Wales, really looking at the kind of the ways that people came together as part of this activism. So um, we have Elaned, um, a character at the, the sort of heart of this, who is sort of recently finding out who she is in terms of her identity. Um, and this kind of happens around the same time as being involved in a lot of other things. So she sort of starts these relationships um, and, and all of these sorts of things. It's very, it very much has that kind of that kind of energy of, you know, being like a teenager or young adult um, and kind of, you know, you just want to go out and do things. You want everything's new. Everything's being explored for the first time. Everything's to some degree both scary and exciting. Um, and it's kind of a bit raucous, but equally at the same time, you're massively unsure of yourself. Um, but this, in this case, with a very good soundtrack. Um, so it's just a, yeah, a really fun book um, that I, I just had a, a great time with. And another book from the Polari Prize long lists, uh, Word Monkey by Christopher Fowler. Um, and this is um, a really beautiful book in many ways that does so, so many different things. It's um, in many ways a memoir, particularly a memoir about um, Christopher Fowler and his sort of, uh, his sort of diagnosis with cancer and then him sort of dealing with that and, and kind of trying to process that but it's, it's also a book about writing and the process of writing and often these two things kind of come together in really interesting ways so he will talk for example about um, what it means to be um, somebody going through the healthcare system as a cancer patient during lockdown and things around Covid um, and he'll then use that to sort of extrapolate to talk about the political situation in the UK and what was happening in those early stages of the pandemic. And then from there into the use of language and what that use of language um, teaches us both about the kind of machinations of politics, but also creative writing and various other things. And it takes these wild leaps that at first don't seem like they'd make any sense. Um, but there's something so compelling about this. Um, and particularly when you sort of come to realise with this book that you know, Christopher Fowler is unfortunately no longer with us. Um, this was his last book. And um, this book, I think, was released last year. And so we suddenly get this sense of the, there's also a kind of, um, in some ways he's taking you down these little winding garden paths, but there's also an impatience and kind of um, sort of focus to his writing because he knows that maybe this is going to be his final one. And he talks a lot about that process um, and how, writing is this sort of pursuit where he feels like he has to get it down. Um, but should this be, this should probably be a short book because he doesn't know how long he's going to have left. Um, and so many other things like that. And all of this makes it sound incredibly dark. This is a very fun and funny book in many ways. He talks with a lot of love and joy about so many moments and so many things. There are references to TV shows and films and things. Um, he is also clearly very well read and talks passionately about other books. And so it's it's in so it's sort of so many things kind of coming together in one. 
Um, but I really just felt so much power in this book. It's such a glorious book and such an achievement. Um, uh, kind of almost has that kind of, almost for me, like a sort of David Bowie, Black Star kind of quality of this is my final thing. So I'm gonna, I want it to do something. I want it to, to mean what I want it to mean. Um, and there's something really beautiful about that, um, I think, uh, to this book that, that really, yeah, really struck me. Um, and I, I think as well as being a really solid book with writing advice and a really funny book about his life and a really poignant memoir, it also sort of connects the dots of some other things. That I just think it is really stunningly done. Uh, next up, I read um, a book that is, I was going to say it was a funny book and then realised it's kind of quite sad <laughs> in many ways as well. It, it toys the line, it sort of, you know, toes that line between the two. Uh, this is Glorious Exploits by Ferdia Lennon. Um, and this, in many ways, is a wild romp and a bit of a kind of, it, it's a reimagining of kind of the, the sort of Greek myth stories that we have because essentially what's being what's being done here is um we have a kind of greek tale um told in a kind of modern vernacular um and so you know characters will be walking around kind of being like oh you know they'll say things that you could hear on a street in the uk or in ireland or wherever else now um and the author is irish um and in many ways that shows there's a real kind of irish humor to it that I, I loved. I thought this was incredibly fun. Um, and the core concept is that there are these two men who are putting on um, some plays. And um, they one of the plays is Medea uh, by Euripides. Um, and um, there's also a second play that's attached to it, which is the final play by Euripides. Um, and the book pulls on some of these ideas of the loss that many of the people around um, these plays would have felt, right? So that people would have lost people in wars, um, they would have lost them in these horrible circumstances. And so going to see a play can be this moment of catharsis, um, of seeing these things happen on stage and this kind of collective grieving or collective acknowledgement happening. But at the same time, this is a wildly funny book at times that's just completely bonkers and silly. And so the book just does this very, when it has its moments of tragedy and um and sort of pathos it does so in this it basically almost like the structure of play it kind of leads you there and then tries to take you back out um and i, I just thought this was really exceptionally done and i'm annoyed that this is a debut <laughs> partly because i want to read other things by this author and also just because like how dare he be this good out of the like straight out of the gate <laughs> like this is such a, a brilliant piece of writing um and i just really loved it the audiobook if you do get a chance to, to listen to it is great as well because it's it's uh, read by Ferdy Lennon himself um, and you kind of get a real sense for the kind of Irishness um, in this and there's something kind of quite wild about hearing like Eumen uh, Euripides kind of re frequently referenced in this really Irish accent um, and sort of really having a sort of slight, slight disjunct about where you are. Um, I loved it. I thought this was really, really fun. Next up, in a sort of similar vein, really, um, I read uh, Horse by Willie Vlautin. Um, and it's a kind of wild book. Um, it's ostensibly about a singer-songwriter, or mostly songwriter, who kind of really puts down on paper and kind of into music this pain and this, this sort of suffering. And, and there's a kind of collective quality where everybody can really feel the emotions in these lyrics. There's something very universal about the way that he writes these songs. And um, early into the narrative, there's a horse, hence the title of the book, um, that sort of essentially appears. And there is a decision to be made about what to do with the horse in terms of its suffering and its pain and, you know, the right decision and, and all of these sorts of things and where it came from and this kind of mystery of it. And all of that kind of unravels this sort of wider feeling about kind of men and tenderness because the men in this book kind of only really seem to be allowed to express these emotions through lyrics and through the kind of performance of them and actually the conversations between the men themselves often doesn't seem to allow that they kind of to some degree you know they, they kind of keep things short and sweet and 
men will say to each other things like, oh, wow, I really love those lyrics. They really, you know, they were really important. They really hit hard. But nobody really is having a big conversation about, um, like, uh, kind of h how they really feel. It, it's sort of they have to channel it through something like this. And so it's, a, it's quite a short book, but I thought was really effective in kind of creating this very specific world um, that these characters live in and sort of testing the parameters of that. I thought this was, yeah, really beautifully done. And last but not least, um, a kind of a booker book in a different way. This is from my my project to read the shortlists. Um, and this is The Dark Room by Rachel Seifert. Um, and it's very, very shiny now in the light there, trying to catch it so it's not. Um, this is a book that uh, is quite interesting in, in several ways because it's essentially three novellas popped into one book. Um, and at first I was looking for it to naturally have linkages between um, the three parts. I, I kind of thought these were going to be three strongly connected narratives, as, as in, you know, characters would reappear in other people's narratives. Um, and without spoiling anything, that's not quite the case. The book is more intrigued by this idea of guilt and kind of, um, particularly the kind of after effects of World War Two. So we meet three characters, um, three main characters over the course of this book, and they're told as perspectives from them. So we have um, one, and I'm going to completely forget his name now, Helmut, um, who is a photographer, um, and he is, he takes sort of s some slightly iconic and sort of important photos right at the end of World War Two, as things are changing, as uh, Soviets are marching on sort of in towards Berlin. And so he is there to kind of capture these moments of history. Um, we then have Law, who is um, a young girl right at the end of World War II, whose family we sort of learn have been involved in um, various parts of the war, more on the side of the Nazis. And so Law is this kind of outcast, but is trying to find home. So she embarks on a journey that involves walking through Germany, basically, to find her family in another town. Um, and we have the story of um, Misha, I believe, yeah, Misha, who is um, in sort of more towards the current day. And he is trying to look back on his family history and work out if his family were on the side of the Nazis, essentially, um, and try to kind of unpick what his family members were doing at various times. And so these kind of three narratives, in many ways, kind of collectively pick at the kind of historic moments of, of World War II it is this sort of idea of what's the kind of immediate moment, what does it look like in the immediate aftermath of war, and what does it look like many years later where you're trying to unpick if your family were the good guys or not, um, and that kind of sort of guilt that can exist within that of, you know, if your family have done wrong, where does that place you, and again, can you be part of accepting that guilt or not, can you accept an apology? Can you apologise for them? Can you do any of those things? And so I thought this book probed at some interesting things in this very kind of spare prose. It's very quick and readable. Um, it's not sort of furnished with this sort of this sort of lyrical quality. It's very to the point. Um, and in some ways that makes it even more heartbreaking in certain passages. So I thought this was a really interesting book. So those are the books that I've uh, been reading this week um, in the background of the booker. Um, I hope you are having a really good week and um, yeah, I hope things are going well. Uh, take care and see you next week. Um, I hope you are, yeah, I hope you have a great reading week ahead. Take care and speak to you all soon. Bye bye.